Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. As I'm sure you're aware, legendary soul singer Aretha Franklin passed away last month. Much has been written in the past few weeks about who she was and what her work meant to so many people, and I wanted to pay my own small tribute to the Queen of Soul by talking about one of her most enduring songs, Respect. Interestingly, despite being clearly associated with Aretha Franklin, Respect is actually a cover. It was originally written and performed by another great soul singer, Otis Redding. However, Franklin took many steps to make the song her own, starting with the lyrics themselves. Redding's version tells the story of a desperate man pleading with his woman to show him some respect when he's around, while Franklin's version changes it into an anthem of female empowerment. Redding is begging for respect, but Franklin is demanding it. Moving on to the music itself, though, the song really only has two sets of chords. The intro... and the verse. There's also the chorus, but it uses the intro progression. The only time it does anything really different is the saxophone solo, which we'll get to in a bit, but first I want to look a bit more closely at these two sections. I think we're pretty clearly in the key of C, which means the intro goes back and forth between the one chord and the four chord, while the verse alternates between five and four. This sort of structure where a short, simple loop is repeated over and over is sometimes called a vamp, and it's a great technique for making space so that your lead parts can shine. In terms of the harmony, though, this progression is pretty clearly an homage to traditional blues forms. Specifically, it's a compressed version of the 12-bar blues pattern, one of the most famous chord progressions of all time. I won't go over it in detail here since it's not what they're actually playing, but basically the first eight bars alternate between the one and the four chord, kind of like our intro, and then it ends by going five, four, one, and if we drop the last chord, we get the vamp from our verse. We can also see blues influence in the chord qualities. They're all dominant sevenths. Traditionally, you'd expect only the five chord to be dominant, with the one and four chords being major sevenths instead, but one common feature of the blues is that all the chords are dominant, which adds a bit more of an edge, so no matter where you go, it never feels completely settled. Still though, it's hard to deny that the chords here are fairly straightforward. Fortunately, despite my personal fascination with all things harmony, there's actually a lot of other ways to make music interesting, and this song is a great example of plenty of them. At its heart, musical interest is all about change. If things get too repetitive, the music gets boring. So if the chords aren't changing, other things have to, and the song keeps making small adjustments to the arrangement so that it never gets stale. Let's start with the intro. It comes crashing out of the gate with these blaring horns and a big attention-grabbing guitar lick. This is a very high-energy section, and it sets the stage for the rest of the song. I also want to highlight the bass part. They could have just played quarter notes, but we're trying to create motion here, so instead we get this cool 16th note figure in the first bar, and then in the second bar there's a walk-up which is syncopated, meaning all the accents fall on the upbeats. This creates a bunch of extra rhythmic interest, and the same basic figure persists throughout most of the song. The walk-up also features both B-flat and B-natural. The B-flat is an added blue note that isn't in the key of C, but is in the C7 we've been using as our one chord, while the B is in the key, but it's also a tritone above F, the root of the chord we're playing, so both these notes are dissonant and exciting in their own ways. From there we move into the verse, where the horns drop out and the guitar switches to just rhythmic mutes, where they deaden the strings with their hand and then strike it to create a percussive sound with no real pitch. These are placed on beats 2 and 4, kinda like bonus snare drums. The bass keeps chugging along and we also hear what sounds like an organ in the background, quietly laying down the actual chord so the harmony doesn't get completely lost. But this section is dominated by the vocals. Everyone is staying out of Aretha's way. The melody here features more of those blue notes, starting most phrases on the flat third of the key borrowed from the F7 chord. There's also some background vocals singing short little ooh sounds to punctuate the chord changes. Then we get to the chorus and those background vocals take over, singing the main melody while Franklin ad-libs on top of them. This is also where the piano starts to creep in, also played by Franklin, but its big entrance is in the second verse where large piano chords replace the background singers on the downbeats. <laughs> And then, after a few more bars, the singers come back and join in too. From here, things settle down slightly. During the second chorus and third verse, the main thing that changes is Franklin's piano, which loosens up a bit with some added notes and a more improvisational feel. We're just slowly ramping the energy back up to where it was in the intro. In the third chorus, though, something interesting happens. The background vocals change. For the first two choruses, we had this cool rhythmic just a little bit phrase, but in the third one they start by repeating just a over and over, kinda like a drone. Before that gets too boring though, they flip back to the original version to keep the energy up. Which brings us to the solo, where the whole thing is broken up by some wildly different chords. 
This looks like we've changed keys to F sharp, which is a huge shift. It's literally as far as possible from our previous root, C. That's good though, standing out like that helps this section grab your attention right when you were starting to get bored of the repetition. We also see a return of the horn section that's been missing since the intro, making this transition stand out even more. As for the chords, we've got one minor going to four major. This is one of my favorite progressions in the whole world, and it means we're using one of my favorite scales, Dorian. It's basically the minor scale, but with a raised sixth note, and it gives you this cool minor sound that's not too sad. King Curtis, the sax player, leans into that Dorian feel, laying down a short, sweet solo before the band lands on G7, which sets up a return to the verse. Here the horns drop out again, but the rest of the band continues to ramp up the energy, and when we get to the chorus, we again see the background singers singing something different, but let's skip ahead to the real show-stopping moment, the R-E-S-P-E-C-T section. This uses a technique called a rhythm stop, which is where the rhythm, well... Stops. Or at least the band does. They punctuate the section with a few big chord hits, but most of it is just Franklin belting all on her own. Well, actually, she's got a little accompaniment from a tambourine, but mostly alone. After that, they just let loose with everyone ad-libbing over the chorus progression. The horns come in, the background singers switch back and forth between various lines, and Franklin is just singing her heart out. They're pulling out every trick they've got to make this ending big, which brings me to the final technique they used to stop this song from getting boring. They made it short. It's only two and a half minutes long, as opposed to this video about it, which is... yikes. Could they have used some more of these tricks to keep it going? Probably. I'm sure they could have got another minute out of it, but they didn't. They let the song last as long as it wanted to, and then they stopped before it got old. And it's not like it feels short. There's so much energy in it, and the fade out at the end makes it seem like it could go on forever. But in reality, it goes on exactly long enough. Of course, there's one final ingredient here, the voice. I don't tend to talk about vocal performance in these analyses, not because they're not important, but because I think their importance is fairly obvious. It requires no great insight to tell you that part of what makes this song great is that Aretha Franklin was a phenomenal singer. But still, she was. She had incredible power, control, and she poured her heart into every performance. She was the queen of soul, and she will be missed. Thanks for watching, and thanks to Patreon patron Susan Jones for suggesting this song. If you'd like to see your favorite song analyzed, just head on over to Patreon and pledge at any level. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.